Thank you, ladies, for your work with the kiddos. We appreciate that very much. Take your Bibles and stand as we're going to honor God and the reading of His Word. Deuteronomy chapter 26. Deuteronomy chapter number 26. Because today is our nation's Independence Day. That hadn't happened for a while. I said to the Sunday school, I don't know when the last time July 4th fell on a Sunday. But since it is, I wanted to bring a message entitled, Some Parallels of Patriotism. Some Parallels of Patriotism. I'm going to read uh, several verses out of chapter 26 of Deuteronomy, then one out of chapter 33, and then we'll read one parallel or companion verse out of Psalm 33. But I'm going to read from Deuteronomy 26, beginning in verse 5. Beginning in verse 5. And God says through Moses to the children of Israel, Thou shalt speak and say before the Lord thy God, A Syrian ready to perish was my father. He's talking about the history of Israel, how they became a nation. And he went down into Egypt and sojourned there with a few and became there a nation, great, mighty, and populous. And the Egyptians evil entreated us and afflicted us and laid upon us hard bondage. And when we cried to the Lord God of our fathers, the Lord heard our voice and looked on our affliction and our labor and our oppression. And the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with great terribleness and with signs and with wonders. And He hath brought us into this place and hath given us this land, even a land that floweth with milk and honey. Go to chapter 33, a few chapters ahead there in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 33:29. Deuteronomy 33 and verse 29, where again Moses is speaking about the nation of Israel, and he says, Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. And then one companion verse, if you'll turn to Psalm 33, the Psalms, Turn to Psalm 33, and just one verse that we'll read, verse number 12. Psalm 33 and verse number 12 says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the people whom He hath chosen for His own inheritance. Let's pray together. Dear God and Father, again we love You and we praise You, Lord. We thank You for Your watch care over our nation and the parallels that America has with the nation of Israel. Help us to understand this subject of patriotism and to be patriots in the right sense of the word and not the abusive sense. Bless, Lord, our meeting together today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. Thank you. On this Fourth of July holiday, our nation seems more divided than ever. The reasons for these, uh, this division are very, very numerous. But among them, for sure, is the question of American greatness, or what mo- most people might call patriotism. Our former president, Donald Trump, ran on a platform called Make America Great Again, or as it was shortened to say, America First. In order to discuss the place of patriotism in America, and especially for us as Christians living in this country, I thought it would be intriguing to compare modern American patriotism with that of biblical Israel and their patriotism. And I think we can learn some very valuable lessons that we can apply to ourselves today. I've always been amazed at how many parallels you'll find If you look closely and just do the comparisons and so forth between modern day America and Old Testament Israel. For instance, I'll just give you a short list of these. There's many more. It could deserve its own message in itself. But both nations were born by God, birthed by God. Think of how we just read where uh, Moses spoke of how Israel was born through the, through the man Abraham. God led him to Canaan out of Ere the Chaldees and through him and his son Isaac and then Isaac's son Jacob and the twelve tribes. We can see God was all in the birth of that nation of Israel. But I'll tell you the same is for our country. There's no doubt about it that God was in the founding of this country. 
The birth of American, uh, America as a nation in the United States was that of a direct intervention of God. Not just leading the pilgrims to Plymouth Rock in 1620, but how the whole thing unfolded to the time of the Revolution and, and the founding documents of the Declaration of Independence and our beloved United States Constitution. I think of another parallel. Both Israel and America were based on a new faith system. A new faith system. Israel really was the first nation after the uh, Tower of Babel and the and the kind of the demise of, of the world. That's why God had to choose one man to create a new nation from. They started a monotheistic faith system. Uh, going back as far as Abraham, there was really no other monotheism in the world. People were polytheists. They may have all kinds of different gods. It was a new faith system founded by Israel. And in many ways, the comparison is the same with America. Though it was not a brand new faith system per se, it was a new faith system of religious freedom. Until the American experiment, there was no such thing as as religious freedom in the world. That's why our founding fathers, especially the early pilgrims and Puritans, made their way over to the New World because in Europe and other parts of the world, you had to worship according to how the state told you to worship. And there was great penalties and persecution if you didn't. So we were, both nations were, were actually born with a new faith system. We could say they were both the same, but they were blessed with a wonderful land. Blessed with a wonderful land. Oh, you think of the land of Israel. Even today, if you take a trip over to the modern state of Israel, there's no land like it in the Middle East. Do you know, outside of America, the only other nation in the world that has an immigration problem is Israel. They have the same immigration problem we do. Why does everybody want to come to Israel? Because it's a prosperous place. The land's a beautiful land. It's a tiny little place, but it's beautiful. When, when we took our tour to Israel in 2008, and you go up there, especially in the northern part of Galilee, and you drive down through to come down into Judea where Jerusalem is, uh, fields and fields of vegetables and fruits makes me think much of the Central Valley of California. Both of those places grow most of the food of the world. If you took out California and Israel, the world would starve. Most of the exported food of the world comes from those two places. And it's a beautiful land. When I think about America... Oh, many of you have saw a lot more of our country than I have, but I've been in, in a number of places. My wife and I just got a chance to, to go to the Phoenix area, area for the first time to see my daughter about a month, two months ago. I'd never been down there. And beautiful place, beautiful place. We've been, we've been up to, uh, uh, to, to see things up in the north, northeast, the beautiful wooded areas of New England. I've been out to California, and, and we've been down to places in various spots, seen some of the most beautiful things in America. It's a wonderful land, a big country. Think about how beautiful uh, our land is blessed by God to be such a wonderful place to live. Both Israel and America became the light of the world. In their time, in their zenith, they both became the light of the world. Israel was, was founded by God to become a witness to the rest of the world. They were to be the light of their world. The pagan Gentile nations around them were to see this, this, this people, this new people that believed in the one true and living God, the only God. And they became a light, were supposed to be a light. And for a time they did let their light shine, but sadly that light went out and God had to replace them with the churches in the New Testament age to then take the, the place of Israel to be a light to the world. But really Israel was a light and America has been a light. Well, since our country was founded... 240 plus years now it's been going technically from the independence in 1776. Our country has been a light to the rest of the world. If you compare all the missionaries, all the literature, all the the churches that have been started, all the money that's been given, all the benevolent help that's been given, all the humanitarian aid from Christians and churches that have come out of America, no other nation even comes close to compare to that. Our nation, America, has been a light to the world. We could say about Israel and America in a comparison again, both brought God's written word, a word to the world. Both America and Israel in their day brought the word of God to the world. Hey, our Bible is a Jewish book. It was written down, humanly speaking, by some 40 plus writers, all of which we believe, maybe one exception, but we're not even sure that. Luke may have been Jewish himself. And so we know that at least all but one writer, and maybe even Luke was Jewish, so it's a Jewish book. 
And it was meant to be given to the world by the Jewish people. All the early Christians who wrote the New Testament that added to the 39 books of the Old Testament were all Jewish. And they gave us the complete scriptures. Israel was the, was the human author of our Bible. But America, in the same vein, has given the world the Bible more than any other country. Bible societies, missionary endeavors, churches, just uh, the, the whole idea of, of printing the Bible. There's been more Bibles printed and distributed from the United States than any other country, by far. No, no one even comes close. Well, we could also say that both Israel and America were built upon God's principles. God's principles. In, in our founding documents, our, our constitution, many state constitutions, are, they follow suit the exact same way. The principles by which we are governed today, religious freedom and freedom of expression, that's all biblical and it came from Israel and they were given those same principles to live by. Think about how both nations were protected by God so many times. Little Israel, in the Old Testament especially, how many times that they were protected and blessed by God. God would send judges like He did in the book of Judges we're studying on Wednesday nights and He would deliver them from their oppressors. Wow, think about how many times America has been protected by God and blessed by God in the conflicts of the world we've been involved in. We had a, a civil war that nearly destroyed our country, but God kept it together. How we have literally uh, saved uh, the oppressed of the world so many times in world wars and in other conflicts. It's been very much the same. God's principles and protection. And then His provision. Oh, think of provision. Hey, no one lives with the, with the, uh, the, 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 the way of living, the, the uh, cost of living, the, the uh, kind of way we live today uh, financially and, and uh, uh, materialistically. Nobody in the world has what we have. The, the standard of living in America is, is above anywhere else in the world. That's why so many people want to come here. And Israel was the same way. In its heyday, Israel was the zenith of the world. Boy, you talk about David and Solomon. During Solomon's kingdom, it came to its highest peak of God's provision. The queen of Sheba took a journey up. She said to Solomon, not even a half has been told to me of your kingdom. It's not even half as much it was, was said to me as what I've seen here. And so God's protection and His provision, His principles have been the same. But we might also include, lastly, I have to say this sadly, both Israel and America have been backslidden away from God. Oh, Israel backslid away from God. That's kind of the story of most of the Old Testament. They get away from God and God allows or brings judgment on them to chastise them and wake them up. And that's what's happened to America. I think we're in the midst of a terrible backslidden condition. We're our nation, and I don't know what number you can put on it, maybe 50 years, maybe longer than that. I don't know when it actually started or at least got going, but, but we are definitely in a free fall. We're definitely backslidden. Our nation's going further and further away from God. Now that brings me to both the text I used today from Deuteronomy 26 and 33 and then that one in Psalm 33 because in, in Deuteronomy, both of those texts show us how special Israel was to God. The land and the people and then the land becomes to our own people. Yes, Israel is a special nation. They're called the chosen throughout the Old Testament. They're the apple of God's eye. They're a unique people unlike any other. And so God calls them special. But what ties this whole message together is Psalm 33 and verse 12 where we read, Blessed is the nation, not, not just Israel, any nation. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. I believe that teaches that any nation, including America, but anyone else as well, any nation in the world at any time, that will make the true and living God their Lord, their Master, the one by which they live and submit to and try to serve and honor, that nation would be blessed. That's what he said. Now, I want to take that idea, the connection between Israel and America, and try to speak on some of these parallels of patriotism. Let me start with just a basic question. We'll answer four questions today in the message, but this is an easy, easy one to start with. What is patriotism? What is patriotism? Well, basically, we say the quick definition is love for one's country. Love for one's country. I put out in my notes the copy of this longer definition. It was found in an online dictionary. It's a good one. It says patriotism. 
or national pride is the feeling of love, devotion, and sense of attachment to one's homeland or country and alliance with other citizens who share the same sediment to create a feeling of oneness among all the people. That's a, a good definition. Do you know that everyone has a certain sense of patriotism about the place they were born and raised? Everyone does. It's natural. Uh, here today we have some good friends, our friend uh, Samson and Margaret and her mother from Nigeria. Now, we're glad they're here in the States, and they honor us by being here. And they've been such a blessing, and I love to meet people from other countries. And in our area, we are blessed to have people from all parts of the world. We go out to UTA, used to. We're going to hopefully go back soon again. We'd meet people from everywhere, and it's such a blessing. But you know what? I, I never have had any hard feelings towards people who had patriotism about their own country. That's a natural feeling. I bet these dear friends, our friends from Nigeria, love their country. Even though they're not living there at the moment, they love their country. It's, it's only right to love one's country. In fact, <laughs> I can go a step further. I just saw who had the shirt on. Our friend Ray had a shirt on from Texas. Here we are, I'm celebrating the 4th of July, but he's going a step further. His patriotism goes to state level. He's got the, uh, the Lone Star of Texas shirt on. I remember a former member who used to be here, it's not any longer, but him and I used to kid, we'd go out visiting together, and I'd tell him about the holy land of Ohio. <laughs> That's where I was born and raised, so I always had a special place in my heart for Ohio. He used to hate when I said that. He's always get out, ah, oh, you northerners, you Yankees, he'd say. But anyway, we all have a certain uh, sense of patriotism. But this brings up the question, number two, is it wrong to be patriotic? Is it wrong to be patriotic? Well, the simple answer is no. Now, I'm going to get into some things about it, but it's natural. It is natural to be patriotic, to have a love and a care and concern for your own country. Back to the Jews and the Scriptures. The Jewish people were very patriotic about their homeland and their people. Do you know that even after being removed a number of times from their land in, in those several captivities that the Old Testament records, do you know the Jews still maintained their love for their land? They kept their customs going. They kept an ancient language called Hebrew going throughout many, many centuries. They were uh, without a homeland for over 1,700 years. When the Romans moved them out of their land, we saw it on one of our videos here a few weeks ago, when the Romans under Titus in 70 A.D. destroyed Jerusalem and that temple that had been built and drove them out, wouldn't even let any Jew live back in that land. Well, they were dispersed among the world for over 17, almost 1,800 years or so. And the Jews still maintained their love for their country. And when they got the opportunity to come back in our lifetimes, at least in our modern times, they founded a nation over there. In 1948, the modern state of Israel was founded. You can't deny that the Jewish people had a very keen patriotism towards the nation and the land that they loved. To show you how important their nation, the nation of Israel, is in their homeland, consider this. The name Israel is mentioned more than any location in the Bible. There's no other place close. 2,568 times Israel's mentioned in Scripture. That's not even including the many symbolic references and other names. That's just the, that's a concordance. You can look it up. 2,568 times Israel is mentioned. And their capital, Jerusalem, is the most often mentioned city in the Bible. Israel's the most often mentioned country or location of any, but now their capital, Jerusalem, mentioned 811 times. Well, you don't have to dig deep or look long to find the patriotism uh, of the Jews towards their land. Let me give you a couple examples. In Numbers chapter 6, in the end of that chapter, we have what's called the prayer of the Shema. The Shema was the blessing that the high priest would give to the people of Israel. And it was started with Aaron, their first high priest. And here's what he was told to say in Numbers 6, 23. Speak unto Aaron and say unto his son, saying, On this wise ye shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, The Lord bless thee. Now this is to Israel. It's not to anybody else. It's to Israel. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. 
If you go to the Psalms, boy, the Psalms are filled with Israeli patriotism. Let me give you some examples. In Psalm 78, which is a great psalm about the history of the Jewish people in their land, it says in Psalm 78, 4, I'm just jumping into partial verses here, uh, we will not hide from them, our children, uh, their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works which He hath done. Now he's going to tell you what He's done. Not just anybody, not just all over the world, though He has done great things there. He says, For He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which He commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, and the children, or even the children, which should be born who should arise and declare them to their children. Man, he's saying, hey, you Jewish people, you love God, you love His Word, make sure you share that from generation to generation. That's how important uh, patriotism was to the Jews. In Psalm 137, this is a kind of a sad psalm. It's about the captivities of Israel, especially the Babylonian captivity. But he says this in the midst of it. It's a really precious little verse. Tell you about their love for Israel and Jerusalem, their capital. He says in verse 5 of Psalm 137, If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. Meaning, if I don't remember Israel, let me forget what they even do with my hands. Let me never forget her. Isaiah, the great messianic prophet, was a very patriotic prophet as well. He writes a lot about the nation of Israel. In Isaiah 41 and verse 8, but thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of, Is or seed of Abraham, my friend. <laughs> That's what he calls Israel, my friend. In Isaiah 44, in verse 1, he says, Yet now hear, O Jacob, Jacob and Israel, interchangeable. Remember, God changed Jacob's name to Israel later. They're interchangeable. Yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus saith the Lord that made thee, and formed thee from the womb, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou Jeshurun, that's another word for Jerusalem, whom I have chosen, whom I have chosen. I'll tell you another way we see patriotism. It's kind of a, a little bit of a different angle on it, but it's still true. Do you know that there's many passages that call down judgment upon Israel's enemies? We call them imprecatory passages, especially Psalms, where the writer is told by God, inspired by the Holy Spirit, to write things against or, or, or bringing judgment upon Israel's enemies. I read from Psalm 83 in verse 1. Keep not thou silence, O God. Hold not thy peace and be not still, O God. Here's, here's the psalmist, Asaph. He's writing the psalm. He's going to call on God to afflict the enemies of Israel. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. He associates the enemies of Israel with the enemies of God. Well, they were one and the same. That's how he saw it. In verse 4, he says, They have said, Come and let us cut them off from being a nation, Israel that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. And yet the psalmist goes on and says this in verse 15, So persecute them. These are all the enemies together. He mentions them all. I just skipped that part. If you go from verse 5 to around 11, you see all these different enemies mentioned. All the Gentile enemies of Israel. Here's what he says, I want, I want you to do to them, God. So persecute them with thy tempest, and make them afraid with thy storm. Fill their faces with shame that they may seek thy name, O Lord. Let them be confounded and troubled forever. Yea, let them be put to shame and perish. That men may know that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, art the most high over all the earth. You remember when I read in our uh, original reading, our text reading, a little statement that is a beautiful little statement. It's used, I didn't get it in the concordance to find how many times it's used. I, I should have, but I know it's used many, many times. And that is the description of the land of Israel as the land that floweth with milk and honey. Now, we might not see the importance of that statement today in our uh, city urban lifestyle that we live in, 
But if you lived in an agricultural society and in, in, in an agricultural way of life like most people did before modern times, especially over in Israel they did, when you called your land a land flowing with milk and honey, what did that mean? It meant it was greatly blessed. Milk comes from what? From cows and goats and so forth. And how do they have so much milk? When they're grazing good and the grass is growing good? How do you get honey? Because the bees, uh, they're creating hives. And bees, bees don't just create hives out of nowhere. They do it when they're well taken care of. And, and the land is plentiful for their own food and water. In other words, it's a, just a picture of blessing. In Leviticus 20, 24, this statement's used. It's a great one. It says, But I have said unto you, Israel, ye shall inherit their land, and I will give it unto you to possess it. He's talking about possessing the land of Canaan when you go in. A land that floweth with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, which have separated you from other people. I'm going to give you that land. You're different. I'm going to bless you with that land. Here's what I'm saying. I'm answering the question. Is it wrong to be patriotic? No, it's not wrong. If it wasn't wrong for Israel to be patriotic about their nation for the right reasons, and we'll get into our next point about that, is it wrong for you and I to be patriotic about America for the right reasons? I don't think so. I don't think so. And in fact, I have to say, for the sake of we that love God and love righteousness and see our Christian heritage in American history... We have every reason to be patriotic. We have every reason to thank God for American history and for what our nation uh, has done in the world and how it's affected our own lives. And so I would not say it's wrong to be patriotic. Now, that leads me, though, to a disclaimer and a kind of a taking the other side in this next point. Can patriotism turn into bigotry? Can patriotism turn into bigotry? And the answer is yes, it can. Patriotism can go too far and become hateful against all other peoples or cultures. Listen to this quote from a man that you'll know from another book. His name was George Orwell. George or Orwell wrote the popular book 1984. He wrote it back in the 30s, though. And many of the things he wrote in 1984 have come to pass. It was almost prophetic. But here's what he wrote back in the 40s about patriotism. He could see it during World War II and how it was having a bad effect on the world. He said, by patriotism, I mean devotion to a particular place and a particular way of life, which one believes to be the best in the world, but has no wish to force upon other people. That's, he says that's the right kind of patriotism. But now he goes into showing how it was affecting the world in World War II and in that period in a wrong way. He says, patriotism is of its nature defensive, both militarily and culturally. Nationalism, he's going to kind of compare patriotism in a good way to nationalism. That's kind of this almost cultic belief that your nation is the only right nation in the world and all others are less than. He says nationalism, on the other hand, is inseparable from the, from the desire for power. The abiding purpose of every nationalist is to secure more power and more prestige, not for himself, but for the nation or other unit in which he has chosen to sink his own individuality. I really believe that he had in, in his thinking there, I, I didn't see him refer to it, but I bet he had in his mind the two main totalitarian dictatorships that were the cause of World War II. Uh, Hirohito's Japan and Adolf Hitler's Nazi Germany. If you study the so-called patriotism of Nazi Germany and that of Japan, the, the land of the rising sun, you'll see that that kind of patriotism was cultic and it was evil. It taught, for instance, in Hitler's case, you know, that the Aryan race of the Germanic peoples were higher on the evolutionary scale than any other, and so no other people lived up to them. So all the rest were worthy of death and worthy to be exterminated to get them out of the way. That's False patriotism. That is patriotism gone into bigotry. The French atheist Voltaire, who I would hardly ever see a good thing to say about, did make one statement that I agreed about in, in his own words about the French Revolution. He said this about the French Revolution. It is lamentable that to be a good patriot, they used to call the, in the revolution patriots, well, wait a minute, we called ourselves in the American Revolution patriots, but he said in the French Revolution, they called themselves patriots too. 
But it didn't mean the same thing, and it definitely shouldn't be applied the same way. He said it is lamentable that to be a good patriot in France, one must become the enemy of the rest of mankind. He was right. i got to give him credit. He said something right. That false patriotism becomes bigotry. Do you know we see examples of bigotry that started with patriotism but went too far? We see it in Scripture. And we see it in two ways, both ways actually. First of all, we see it by the Jews. Do you know the Jews, as time went on, became so isolated and so, so arrogant in a way about their own history and their own nationalism that they began to look down on the Gentiles and, and hate the Gentiles and, and be glad they weren't Gentiles and not have much to do with them. Jesus even dealt with this, and John the Baptist did. Listen to what John the Baptist said to the Jewish leaders when he began to baptize at the Jordan River. You remember what he said here? He says to them, Bring forth therefore fruits worthy or meet for repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say to you that God is able of these stones to raise up children of Abraham. What, what did he mean by that statement? Did you catch that? He said, don't say within yourselves, we be Abraham's children. That was pride. That was a nationalism gone awry. He says, don't pride yourself off being Jewish as if the rest of the world is, is nothing. And just because you're Jews, you have some special place. He said, God can make children of Abraham out of these stones if he wants to. Do you know that the early church, the first division in the early church, I'm talking about true Christianity now, not just the, the false uh, Judaism that, that John the Baptist exposed among the religious leaders that were blind to truth. I'm talking about even true Christians were having a problem with, with bigotry. Remember the problem that the early church had to meet in, in Acts 15 at the church at Jerusalem and even the few churches that existed came together and had this big council because there were people teaching that you had to literally become Jewish to be saved, weren't they? We called them Judaizers. They were teaching people, hey, you, you Gentile dogs, that's what they would call them, you can't be saved unless you get circumcised or keeping the law of Moses. And they had a, the first big conflict in church history about dealing with that in Acts 15. And they settled it right. Paul especially was a stalwart. He was a staunch defender of grace. He said, you don't have to be a Jew to, to be saved. That's, that's pagan. That's heretical. That's anti-gospel. That's anti-Christian. See, but, but then it went the other way too. I mean, we know it's went the other way. How about Jews hating, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, Gentiles hating the Jews? Scripture has many examples of that too. You know, sometimes you wonder why Jewish people even today are kind of anti-Gentile and they kind of keep to themselves. Well, they have some pretty good reasons to be anti-Gentile when you think about all the persecution they have come under. Not just Hitler's Holocaust, but all through history, the Jews have been persecuted and hated by Gentile people. Some in the name of Christ, believe it or not. It's crazy, but it happened. And there's been people like, like Haman. Remember Haman? I was talking to the guys on our Bible study uh, Thursday night on Zoom about Haman, an example of, of Jewish, uh, the Jews being annihilated. It wasn't just Hitler that came up with that idea. Haman, way back in the book of Esther, tried to have all the Jews annihilated. In fact, he had even uh, 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 talked the king into signing a decree that all the Jews would be killed on, the, on a certain day in a certain month. In Esther 3 and verse number 8, it says, And Haman said unto king Ahasuerus, There is a certain people, listen to his description of the Jews, scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom, and their laws are diverse from all people, neither keep they the king's laws, therefore it is not for the king's prophet to suffer them. That means to allow them to live. And he butters up Ahasuerus the king to sign a decree that they will all be wiped out. By the way, I think that's exactly why Jesus had to come on the scene with a message that was so radical in his day, so unbelievably different, when he said in the Sermon on the Mount, Love your enemies. He said that the Jewish people, really, the only people that really heard Jesus in the flesh when he had his three and a half year ministry, were Jewish people. He said, love your enemies. They had, had, had gotten to the point where they thought you could hate your enemies, and that was good. The Jews began to teach it, that, you know, the more you hate the Gentiles, the better off you are. Don't let a Gentile in your house. Don't ever go into the house of a Gentile. Jesus said, no, where'd you get that from? Love your enemies. 
Hey, they should have just understood their Old Testament. God never said to hate your enemies. That's not biblical. Deuteronomy 10 and verse 19, that's one of the earliest books of the Bible. Listen to what it says. Love ye therefore the stranger. Stranger would be the non-Jew, would be the Gentile. For ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. God never told us to hate others who aren't like us. That's where bigotry and prejudice come from. We have so much of that in our country, and our country is suffering so much from it. That's not of God. See, patriotism is right unless it becomes bigotry. It should never be that. Hey, I, I have every bit of respect and love for people who love their country. You know, I've been in other countries. I went abroad and been in other countries. And, you know, when I meet those people, I don't, I don't put them down. You know, one of the worst things that, that bugs us Americans, I think it does, uh, you probably, if you're from America, is people come to our country and then they badmouth our country. Hey, I wouldn't go to somebody else's country and badmouth how they lived. That's our country. And, and they have their language and they have their culture and their customs. And so when you and I think of patriotism, remember, it's not wrong to be patriotic, but it's wrong if we let it become bigotry. Now, that brings us to our last point, which we'll spend the most time on. And that is, what's the right balance for a patriotic Christian? Well, what's the right balance? Man, this is a tough one. Remember, you know, patriotism's not wrong, but if we're not careful, it can get into a, a, the, the realm of bigotry. I think, first of all, let me give you five points on this. Number one, know what your first allegiance is, or know who your first allegiance is to. Hey, I love America. I make no bones about that. I love our country. I share the history of America with people when I have a chance to, if they don't know where, uh, how America was founded and the Christian history in America. I, I love to share that. I, and I'm proud of being American in the right sense of that word. But my first and foremost allegiance is not to America. It's to God. He is my first and foremost Lord and Master. Okay, and I think Christians need to be very careful that we don't all of a sudden get our focus too much on America where we get our allegiances finally to God. God tells us in his word that our final destination is not American soil. It's not what we have in America. We look for another place, another city, another life. I like how Hebrews eleven sixteen says... But now they, that's us Christians, they is the Christian, desire a better country. I don't care what country you live in, he said. We desire a better country. That country, or I'm sorry, that is an heavenly country. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Hey, I'm looking for a, hey, I love America. It's a beautiful country. I love living in Texas. It's a wonderful place to live, but I'm not looking to stay here forever. This isn't my final home. <laughs> I'm going to a city whose builder and maker is God. So we need to know our first allegiance. Do you know the Bible teaches that you and I are citizens of two countries while we're on earth, if you're saved? Yes, you're a citizen of the country you live in. Maybe you have dual citizenship even, but I'm talking about you have an earthly citizenship. Yes, I'm a citizen of the United States of America. Born here, given a social security number, identification, all that. I'm a natural born American. But my real citizenship is in heaven. Paul said, Philippians 3 and 20, For our conversation or lifestyle, our lives are in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That conversation really is citizenship who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to do all things unto himself. Do you remember when Pontius Pilate was grilling our Lord? He was speaking to him to try to find out what he had done worthy of crucifixion. And he had no truth in his mind. He was blind of truth and, and even asked Jesus what is truth. But you remember Jesus' words, and these are so clear to you and I. It, I'm talking about keeping our allegiance right. To make sure we realize, friend, if you're saved, I don't care what country you're from, whether you're America, whether you're from any other place, yes, you should have a right patriotism about where you, where you were born, where you lived, and where you're from. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. That's natural born. But if you're a Christian, you now, you now have a new 
allegiance. And that's to Jesus Christ, our master. He said to Pilate this, when Pilate said, uh, he was telling him, hey, I have power to crucify you. Don't you know that? Jesus said, my kingdom, John 18, 36, is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence or here. He said, it's not from here. See, that's where we need to keep a focus on the right way. Hey, I love living in America. I'm glad for the freedoms we enjoy. But hey, I'm not going to die on the hill of America before I first put my allegiance to Christ and, and put Him first. He is first and foremost. Number two, here's another thing about the right balance to be a patriotic Christian we ought to keep in mind. We need to stand for moral issues and not material ones. Now I'm going to get into this kind of sticky issue of politics here, and it's not about party, that, that isn't important. It's about moral decency and righteousness. Those are the key issues for me, and they ought to be, I think, for every Christian. I mean, I don't, I don't really care what a party says. If a party goes bad, then I get away from the party. I don't care about a party. Uh, you know, I've had to vote Republican for many, many years because they more closely, not perfectly, but more closely have lined up with what I have believed as a Christian. But what happens if the Republican Party goes wrong? I'm leaving the Republican Party then. <laughs> it doesn't have anything to do with the party. It has to do with the issues. It has to do with what's right and wrong. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. That's what Jesus said. That's what I hunger after. That's what Christians should thirst for. We're looking for righteousness. It's these moral issues, not the material ones. Yeah, you know, um, I, we, we should care for the poor, of course, and there's a moral component to helping the poor. I, I understand that. But I think too many politics and, and too many elections and voting has too much to do with the material outcomes. You know, whether so-and-so is going to get this and may, whether so-and-so is going to get that or I'm going to get this, this or I'm going to get that. That should not be top priority for us as Christians. Moral issues ought to carry the day. We ought to care about things like freedom of religion. That's more important than any tax increase or decrease. That's more important than any kind of health care issue or not. How about abortion and traditional marriage and justice? These kind of moral issues. Those are the things we stand for. This is the right balance. I'm going to be patriotic and I'm going to support anybody or any party or any group who, who supports those things. But if they don't, then I don't support them. And if i got to stand alone, I stand alone. That's just the way it is. That's how Christians have always lived. Hey, do you think Christians in Paul's day got their way at the ballot box? There wasn't any ballot boxes. There was, it was a monarchy. They didn't get to vote for anybody. But he still said submit to the higher powers. See, Christians ought to be good citizens. We ought to be standing for the right issues. Number three, I would say this, be model citizens until civil disobedience is our only option. We ought to be model citizens. Friends, I really am concerned about the, the testimony that so many Christian, quote unquote, who claim to be Christian at least, are having because they're so, they're belligerent, they're harsh, they're negative, they're bombastic, they're, they're always you know, fighting and whatever. Hey, we can disagree, but we ought never be disagreeable. Okay? We should never be disagreeable. And I'm not going to lose my testimony, and I pray you won't lose your testimony over an issue that does not directly affect the gospel. I'm not going to lose my testimony over that. I'm just not going to do it. I'll walk away. I'm not going to argue. Hey, do I have opinions about other matters? Of course, and you do too. But I'm not going to lose my testimony, lose my witness to somebody who needs Christ over some very non-important, non-issue. We need to be model citizens. We need to love our country, love our government, pray for our president, pray for our, our governor, pray for our state and local officials. And surely we ought to be involved. Of course we should. That goes without saying. I think that's a no-brainer. We, we ought to be voting. We ought to be praying. We ought to be affecting our local school boards. And, and on and on it goes. And we ought to be model citizens unless or until civil disobedience is our only option. What do I mean by civil disobedience? You probably know what this is, I hope. It is whenever the government, whatever level it's at, state, local, federal, whatever the government 
tries to push us to do or to be something that's against Christ. If it directly violates the law of God, then I've got to follow God. Like Peter said, it's better to obey God than men. That's when we have to put God first. But only in when it's our only option. You know, there's a big debate, and I was talking to someone, I forget, it might have been one of you, I can't remember who it was, recently about the Revolutionary War. There are Christian groups and, and well-named preachers that think that the, the colonists were wrong to revolt against Britain in the Revolutionary War. I disagree with that. I disagree with that. They had every right to. The Bible does not condemn war, per se. Hey, you can't read the Old Testament without reading a bunch of wars that happened. A lot of wars. Israel was invaded many times by enemies. God didn't just say, lay down your weapons and become a doormat. No, you're going to fight back against these imperialistic, oppressive nations. And the Revolutionary War was not wrong. They had every right to stand up for their freedoms against an oppressive maniac, George III, in the British Empire. It was not against God to do what they did. I'll tell you why I know that. You remember that wicked queen, Athalia, in the Old Testament? Athaliah? Some people pronounce it Athaliah. I always pronounce it Athaliah. Here's this wicked witch of a woman who comes to power as queen in Judah, has every one of her grandkids killed but one that got away. That continued the Messianic line, by the way. Very important story. But anyway, hey, after she had been queen for six years, guess what the high priest told the people they needed to do? Kill her. And they did. They, they executed that wicked witch of a tyrant, and God was for it. God wasn't against it. God didn't condemn it. In fact, God led the high priest. He was a wonderful man. In fact, he helped young Joash, the seven-year-old king that would come on the throne after she was killed. God's not against the overthrow of wicked governments. You know what I pray for? I pray in countries like communist China and some of these, these Islamic nations that are under brutal dictators. They have no freedom whatsoever. I pray that coup would happen to overthrow those wicked countries. And we ought to pray the same. And our nation for many, many decades, in, this, in the 20th century especially, helped try to overthrow countries to bring freedom to people. There's nothing wrong with that. I think that's righteous. I think we ought to do that. Now, number four, we ought to work to bring America back for the right reasons. What I mean America back? We, we ought to want to see America return to its former glory, but for the right reasons. I, I don't care for America to come back to be the, the richest nation. We already are, but to be richer or whatever. I don't, I don't really care about America coming back so we can look on our, our noses at everybody else and say, say we're better than them. That, I don't even want any part of that. If you talk about bringing America back to righteousness and see our, nature come, our nation come back to God and turn back to decency and morality and, and hope in people's lives and, and, and to, to overcome all these addictions and things that are ruining and destroying our country, our society, that's why I want America to come back. That ought to be why every Christian wants America to come, to America to come back to its former glory. Lastly, I would say in the right balance for a patriotic Christian ought to be this. We ought to love America's Christian heritage while recognizing our national sins of the past and present. It's not wrong for a Christian to love our heritage and to recognize it. I'm not saying we look down our noses and condemn everybody else who wasn't a part of our country then or didn't come from America originally. What, that's not what I'm saying. I already told you that balance. But I'm not going to avoid thanking God and telling others about the greatness of our country because it was a great country founded by Christian principles. doesn't mean everybody was a Christian. It doesn't mean every one of our founding fathers was born again. I'm not claiming they were. I will tell you this. There's too much documentation to show you that those founding fathers believed in God. They believed in the Bible. They set a nation up with Christian principles that dictated how our nation became great. America would have never been the nation it's been for the last 240 plus years without the Christian faith. Period. There is no argument that can be made against that. I don't care what the evolutionists and the secularists say, they cannot take God out of our history. We ought to love our American heritage because it is a Christian heritage. But at the same time, I would admit, we can never whitewash, sweep under the rug our national sins. What we did to the African people in 
kidnapping them literally and putting them into bondage to be slaves to people to better their plantations and their wealth was a wicked and vile sin God would never support. It should have never happened. And it's a stain on our country to this very day. And any true Christian and godly Christian should have been against it when it happened. I cannot understand how people who had slaves and kept slaves and violated those slaves' human dignity could have claimed themselves to be Christians. I have no sympathy for them at all. What we did to the Native American people was wrong. We should not try to act like it didn't happen. It was wrong. We should have never treated them the way we did. In fact, not everyone did treat them badly. Many of the earliest missionaries went to the Indians with the gospel. But it was the Federalist government in its covetous land grab to try to take over the country and drive those Indians out of these places they lived. We mistreated them on many, many fronts. Hey, I'm not going to deny that happened. We shouldn't whitewash it and, and rewrite history as if it didn't happen. America's a great nation, but we have some really bad sins of the past and present. Am I saying I agree with everything that's going on in America today? You know I'm not. I surely am not. I hate any kind of bigotry, hatred, racism, any kind of mistreatment, neglect, abuse. We ought to stand against that with every bit of our fiber as Christians because we believe in a righteous God who loves righteousness and wants us to live and spread that righteous message to us. Well, I conclude the message by saying this. You know, Israel, they fell away from God. They did. That's the history of the Old Testament for sure. But you know what? God had promised way back in the Old Testament, and He will fulfill it. He's going to bring back the Jews to a status of, of love and, and blessing and, and warmth and, and relationship with Him. He has that in His plan. It hasn't happened completely yet, but it's going to happen. He said it would happen. Here's what I end with. Maybe, maybe as we look at the downfall of America, and it, it is definitely falling fast. I would not deny that. Maybe it is that God would turn us back to him sometime. I know, I, I believe in prophecy. I'm teaching on prophecy on our Sunday school lesson, and I know the scriptures teach there'll be a worldwide apostasy and that there'll be a falling away from the truth before Jesus comes. I know all that. I agree with all that. But it does not change that God is still God and can do what He wants. And many other times in history where Christians thought the world was coming to an end, God turned it all around again. And He could do it again this time if He wanted to. Deuteronomy 32, 28 and 29 says this about Israel. I want to apply it to America. For they are a nation void of counsel. Neither is there any understanding in them. Moses said that about Israel prophetically in their future. That's happened in America right now. But then he says this, and I love his feeling here. Oh, that they were wise, the nation. Oh, America, if it was wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. On this 4th of July, nation divided, all the problems we see. It ought to be our prayer as Christians. In the right spirit of patriotism that we see our nation have a rebirth back to God, a revival among churches, and a return to the ways our fathers founded our nation. Let's pray. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Patriotism is one of those subjects that is kind of debated today, and many are not sure how to deal with it, not sure whether to be patriotic too much or not enough. I think there's a balance. I've tried to give you that balance today. But for Christians, I think there's a great balance that Israel proves to us in the Old Testament. Our invitation will be just a direct one today. As we stand in a moment, we sing, and we listen to the music play. This will be a time for you at this 4th of July just to thank God for being in America. Whether you were born and raised, it doesn't matter. We're glad you're here if you got here. And even if you're not here for the rest of your life, it won't matter. While you're here, you're welcome. You're welcome among churches like this, I can tell you. We love all people here. 
There is no racism in true Christianity. None at all. And because of that, we can say to all people who come to our country, thank God you're here. And we pray for our country to turn back to God. That will be our invitation today. After I pray, we'll stand to our feet. and You'll have a chance to pray on your own. I hope you'll pray for our great country. Dear Lord God, we thank you for America. We thank you for our history. I can't think of another place in the world I'd rather live than here. Having said that, we understand there's sins that are so great in our nation now, such, such darkness that's overcome our great country. And we as Christians are the only salt and life that's left. We're the salt and light that you called us to be, and so help us to be that, God. Call our nation back to a national repentance. Bring circumstances and situations that bring us all on our knees and realize that we can't go on without you. Convict our leaders. May a fear of God overcome them. That they'd realize that all the decisions they make, they shall stand before your supreme court of justice. God bless, Lord, our church. And this invitation, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand, take a moment. You can pray.